I've always liked teaching. I grew up in an academic family. My father was a professor and when at that age that most young boys anyway want to be firemen, if you'd asked me at age four what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a science professor. And I've done that ever since. I haven't really wanted to be anything else over the long haul. watched my father really inspire his students. He was in political science and bring in many different disciplines in the service of what he was trying to teach. And so I've tried to do the same thing. I also had a wonderful opportunity to get involved in teaching early. Uh, when I was in high school, I had the chance to teach one period of the chemistry class. The, the person who was running the science program said, well, Eric, you're not going to learn anything by taking the class. I'd taken it the year before. You should see how it's like to give those classes. And so for an entire year at age, whatever it was, 15, I'm teaching a chemistry and loving it. And the students seem to like it too. I got the chance to hone those skills. John Hennessy, the president of Stanford, has said that if he hadn't had the chance to teach as an undergraduate at Villanova, he probably wouldn't have gone into academics, which would be such a loss. Um, so I had those opportunities. And that was, as I said, what I wanted to do. When I got my PhD, I went to Wellesley College to explicitly to try to start a computer science program in a women's college. Had the chance to come out to California for other reasons, for personal reasons, and eventually got the position at Stanford where I've been since 1990. One of the things about teaching in a college is that you don't really get to do as much research. And I missed the research collaborations. And it, it wasn't really planned, like so many things in life. I ended up going and visiting the new Systems Research Center um, and in the process of going to visit my best friend there, I ran into, in the hallway, out in the street, four other people who had lived in the same dormitory at Harvard <laughs> that I had known. I mean, it was just, ah, oh, that's where they all went. <laughs> and, so, and I remember when I walked into Greg Nelson's office, um, my first question was, well, are you hiring? The answer was yes, and so I interviewed and I moved west. Um, wanted to move west anyway and so this was um, a wonderful opportunity. It wasn't right for me in the long run but it was useful in seeing what was going on in the front lines of the field and working with some of the smartest people in computer science on the planet so uh, can't be a bad thing to do. The idea of how students have changed. Students change I think in response to sort of waves in the society. We, like everywhere else, have seen ebbs and flows of interest in computer science. Some of that follows the economics of the time. You know, after the dot-com collapse at the beginning of this century, there was a decline at Stanford, as there was at most places. Um, but now all of that energy has come back with a vengeance. Um, we declared as majors 40% more students this year than the largest year in history at the height of the dot-com bubble. Uh, so, you know, we, we're the largest undergraduate major, the largest teaching department in terms of units that we, and students that we teach. Um, all of those things are exciting. Of course, they, they keep you busier at the same time. <laughs> students today grow up with technology. That does not at all mean that they grow up with the ideas of programming. In fact, it's harder, I think, in some ways, to learn about 
the programming side or the computer science side of our discipline than it used to be. Um, David Brin, who is one of a science fiction author, wrote a piece about, I would guess, eight or nine years ago called Why Johnny Can't Code. Um, and his rationale is that in the old days when, you know, people in my generation were just starting with computing at the time that computing was just starting in some sense, you know, the only way we could make the computers do what we wanted them to do was to learn how to program them. We had done some surveys over the years and found that students were coming in with far more exposure to computing, but less self-reported programming experience. So I think that's one of the pieces. In the last couple of years, there's another change that's going on. I wrote about this in an essay that appeared last September. We have seen a tremendous increase in the number of students who are taking one or two computer science courses, no matter what their discipline is, because they feel, I think correctly, that they need to have that knowledge and those skills in order to succeed in whatever they choose to follow. Um, those courses sometimes provide students with exactly what they came in seeking, which is a little bit of a skill that they could use in their own discipline, but a surprising number get hooked by it. They've never seen it. They didn't know you could think that way. They didn't know that computer science was creative, that it was fun, that it was challenging, or that they could do it. And when they find all of those things are true, they just get so excited. The field needs so many people. It needs people with a variety of interests and other knowledge so that the applications can move in those directions. Computer science is a unifying technology now for so much of what people build. And we want people with those other skills and computing skills to build the applications that will drive progress across the board. The difficult side is that it's hard to train teachers and hard to employ teachers. The primary difficulty is economic. If you give a teacher the skills necessary to teach computer science, it takes an unbelievable love and sense of mission and dedication to stay in teaching. Throughout his career, Eric Roberts has profoundly influenced the structure and strategies of introductory computer science. He has an amazing ability to engage his students and colleagues. His efforts have improved the computing profession. We are proud to honor him this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Eric Roberts. My wife is a poet. We talk a great deal about how the kind of work that I do to get a program to be right, not just so that it works, but so that it is a wonderful artifact for teaching some concept where every single token in that program matters. It's so much like what a poet does. You know, you think you've got it right, but then you make this little change to improve one piece and that has downstream consequences for how everything else works. So, you know, my books are like that, that you, know, you just you make one tweak in chapter one and everything changes from there because you're concerned about how it fits together. One of the most um, important contributions I've made is I've been part of a team teaching in the interdisciplinary introduction to the humanities program for the last seven years. It's actually continuing under a new name in the future. But, um, and people wonder, why is a computer scientist teaching a course in the humanities? Well, there's a role for a computer scientist. It's a course on technology and utopia. How does the growth of technology change the way literature reflects the perfect society or how writers envision that society? And the interesting irony is that as technology advances, I think it's pretty clear that literary visions of the future become more dystopian. I want to remember the first professor I ever knew 
the person whose work inspired me to think about education creatively, to think about it broadly, and that's my late father, James Roberts, professor of political science, who taught me how much one could do as a teacher in influencing the lives of one's students and how much of a joy it could be. So what we're modeling in front of the classroom is the excitement, you know, the material you can get on the web, in online courses, or you know, ever since Gutenberg you can find in books. What you need in a university classroom is excitement. Mm -hmm.